All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to THP Strength Podcast, episode number 31. Today, it is just me and John Evans. Wow, we haven't done a solo podcast in a long-ass time. I feel like we've, we've had guests for, for a few times, but we're going back to our roots, the OG <laughs> podcast roots, all right? And today, we're going to be talking about a special, special topic. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> John Evans, who is he? How did he become who he is? <laughs> I got that. So I like that. I, I think the reason that I want to do this one, and I asked Isaiah, I was like, should we do this? Uh, I think it'd be a good idea because uh, I posted a little bit about my story on my Instagram story, actually. And a lot of people, I think, were kind of like, I guess maybe there were new people. I don't know. I've been pretty vocal about like the stuff that I've gone through on social media. So a lot of the time, like, I'm, I'm pretty unashamed to share, you know, things objectively that happen to me or whatever else along the way. And I think a lot of people were very, like, supportive of me or um, are supportive of me now. Uh, maybe maybe they weren't at the time or whatever, but uh, maybe they didn't know me or whatever else. But now it, it seems like a lot of people kind of look at what I've done, even my, my peers, like my friends and stuff like that from grad school or undergrad, and they generally are like, wow, damn, like the, he actually made something of himself because I think, I, I think a lot of, the, there were a lot of times in undergrad or grad school where people probably, well, I know for a fact they doubted me or doubted what I was doing and questioned kind of like my goals and my aspirations and my dreams of, of what I wanted to do. So I thought it would be a good one. Um, before we get into that though, we got to talk about this, this thing that may happen in the near, near future uh, for a short period of time, a brief trial period, if you will, with uh, my dear friend Isaiah here. He may he may be uh, making a, a little a little trip down to North Carolina to uh, do a, a little training camp before Dunk League. I don't know if we're allowed to talk I about that. About so- to go into the hyperbolic time chamber, <laughs> the actual hyperbolic time chamber, to learn yeah. from the sensei. Master Yoda. How, yeah. I, I think the the amount of time we've actually gotten to train together, like in person, to, in total, is maybe like like one week at Dunk Camp or two weeks over two years at Dunk Camp. There's two weeks there, which we kind of trained through, not really, but some. And then I came to Florida for about a week and a half, and we trained that entire time too. So Isaiah has worked with me a little bit. But it's kind of funny. Most of the stuff we've done is just like totally correspondence, which is crazy. But it, I don't know. It doesn't really feel that way. But that's just the way. That's like the nature of it. As he always says this, he's always like, wow, I forgot how athletic you were. Whenever I like do things that are athletic, like it just amazes him. It's just mind boggling to him that I could be better than him at things in the weight room or on the track. So I'm, like, I'm looking forward to that probably most of anything. <laughs> yeah. It's also going to be interesting, like actually training together. I feel like a lot of the stuff that we see is like, the result, like the dunking, like usually I'm, I send you my dunks and stuff like that. Today was actually pretty rare. I FaceTimed you mid-workout asking <laughs> you to look at my my box jumps. But uh, I like that though. I haven't I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't done that. So or in a minute. Honestly, I think last time something like that happened was when you were rehabbing my knee. Probably. That was, like that was like, like half years ago then. Yeah. Two years ago. Two and a half years ago. Holy shit. Yeah. Two. It's officially two years. I think. Like a full two years? Like around this time was when we were right in the middle of rehabbing. Yeah, but is that three years ago or two years ago? Two years. That was 2018. I thought it was the beginning of 2018. No, it was, it was, we met. We're technically like mid, we're like beginning to mid uh, 2020 right now. Like we're like, I wow. think we started, we started doing the actual program like March. Yes. Or something like that. So, wow. That's crazy. Well, that's cool. We've made it that far. <laughs> a lot can, bro that just shows how much can happen in two years yeah so much dude then we can talk about that in this whole little this little snippet of what's going on here because you were you were there for a lot of the rougher parts over the last two years um which i don't know it'll be cool to talk about dogs are in the background good dogs uh anyways yeah so i guess i guess we'll, we'll get this underway a little bit we're, we're only four minutes in we didn't really get sidetracked too much but i guess with the two of us we just don't it doesn't quite happen as bad whenever CJ's here. I want to make fun of him and you at the same time. Uh, so feel free to ask questions throughout this, Isaiah. You know, I don't know if you know all this information. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I don't know. 
I guess we'll see. But basically started out where I guess where I guess the probably the best place to start honestly is my hometown. So like I grew up in an area where sports are like worshipped and a lot of like so like my oh man, there's a lot of like personal information I'm gonna have to share. That's okay. You guys are gonna get the nitty gritty, the deep dark parts. Not deep dark, but like there, yeah, there's some dark parts. Um, but I'm just gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I'm not gonna try to like some people say that I can be dramatic and stuff and like stuff like that, but I'm going to just try to be objective and honest about it. I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm going to give you the parts that you need to know that are pertinent. So starting with that, I grew up, I have a, a twin brother who actually runs distance. He's actually a really good athlete and he's a researcher in Maryland. One of the smartest people I know, an older sister. Um, and then my mom and dad split when I was three and my mom got remarried actually when I was 25. So that's kind of like a, unique part of my story maybe that's a little bit a little bit different but um because of that i think my dad left when i was like i said three um so i kind of had like a a period of my life where i didn't have like a father figure there because like my stepdad didn't really step in to take that role because he wasn't my stepdad yet and he's told me this my mom has explained this that like he didn't want to overstep boundaries you know he didn't want to be the dickish stepdad that was like yeah like i'm gonna I'm going to like tell you what to do and like run your life all of a sudden and like be your dad or whatever. Like he, that was something he was super aware of. So he just kind of like let my mom do a lot of that stuff, but he, he played a big role in making sure that we were more financially stable because we were very poor. Like my mom was a painter, <laughs> like in a single parent for three kids. So just like growing up, I had a lot of insecurities, I think because I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, I didn't have someone like a strong father figure there to show me this is what it looks like to be a man. This is what it looks like to stand up for yourself or defend yourself or stuff like that. And I don't know, just the town I grew up, it's only like 10,000 people, but I went, I would just, I was just like bullied a lot as like a little kid, probably like from probably like kindergarten through fifth grade or something like that like I have vivid memories of being bullied and like asking my mom to switch schools because I just like couldn't handle I went to like a Catholic school and I just like hated it like I would I remember there was one time I was like in third grade and Isaiah I don't know again I don't know if you know this so maybe I'll, I'll speak to you more than I'm speaking to the listeners but there was a there was a time when I was in third grade and there was like this kid named Brandon Lucarelli and we were out and I doubt Brandon's gonna listen to this because now we're like kind of friends but we were like out of the playground and I remember we were playing wall ball and like kids would literally just instigate the shit out of my brother and I, like they would do everything they could to just piss us off. Cause they thought it was funny. So he just like, I don't even remember what he was doing. He, he, he like wall ball. The idea is you bounce the ball off the wall. If you catch it after you, or if someone catches the ball that you throw off the wall, then you have to go touch the wall. If you're the person that threw it and they caught it before they hit you. And it was like one of those like ping dodge balls, you know? And for whatever reason, the kids that I grew up with were really good baseball players so they were throwing like hard as shit in like fourth and fifth grade. And I just remember them pelting me with the ball like all the time, like all the time. And it just me just like getting pissed off because it, I mean, it did it piss me off. And I just remember always like wanting to prove them wrong. That was like something I always wanted to do every single year, first, second, third, fourth grade. I was just like, God, I wish I was just more athletic so I could just like prove these people wrong because they're just pissing me off every single day. Like I would avoid playing. I like wanted to be a part of that, but I would avoid it completely because I was afraid of getting made fun of or like being embarrassed or was it just like was you weren't good enough like were you not athletic compared to them like was that the reason why like yeah were, for sure. well they like their dads worked with them all the time on baseball and football and like they were like pushed to be good at sports by their dads because that's like the way our hometown is and so there were like two there were like four or five kids that like um probably not even that maybe maybe like yeah probably like four or five yeah four or five uh guys like in our class that were just like the cool kids in the class you know it was like a super small class of like 25 you know I went to a small Catholic school and they just were so far ahead developmentally in terms of sport at that age like they could throw so hard at their age like they're just bigger than I was that I was like I was like a little bit pudgy like not fat but I was like I was like I don't know I had a belly I was skinny fat I was like skinny fat as a little kid um and so like I was just super insecure I had a gap I had a really big gap in my teeth like big gap probably like literally this pencil yeah bro that's nothing this pencil 
could fit through my teeth. That's how big my gap was. Like it was big. And I was just super insecure. Like I was just the most insecure little kid ever. I remember like looking back at other people, like my friends and stuff, and just being like, I wish I'd looked like them. Like I wish I was as athletic as them. I wish I looked like them. Like I wish that I was as good as they were. And then I had a twin brother there who like is better than me at everything. Like he's faster than me. He throws harder. He's better at sports. He does better than me at school. Um, he like generally is more likable and I like have a vivid memory of we, us coming home. My brother being like me being like, no one likes me at school. My mom like, Oh, that's ridiculous. Of course people like you. And my brother being like, no, really like no one likes him. Like <laughs> it was, it's like crazy that I just, I just like had a terrible, terrible experience in elementary school. And like it, 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 it sticks with me, obviously. Like I haven't forgotten any of that. I remember all of that, all the shit that people did bullying me growing up. Like I have not forgotten it. And honestly, like, I probably need to get better about forgiving them because there are certain people that I just I still to this day don't forget because of the way they treated me when I was like in fourth grade. Like I remember going to baseball practice and people just like telling me to go stand in the outfield because it was just like, yeah, you suck at sports. You're not athletic. Like that's the way that I was perceived as a little kid. It's like you are a loser. <laughs> like that's the way I was treated. So it and the reason that this is important is because it sets up everything that I do from that point on it's it's like why I am the way that I am because I think if you don't know that about my life if you don't know that I basically hated myself I hated everything about myself like you wouldn't understand why I act the way that I do and why I am as driven as I am because like it just it wouldn't make sense you know what I mean that's why I had to start with that so that's some personal shit but that yeah reminds me, this is kind of related but uh the Michael Jordan documentary that just came out I haven't seen it yet, but go ahead. <laughs> Do you care if I spoil one little thing about it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So Michael Jordan, they were talking about obviously how he can be like so motivated and so driven to like to just win, like just straight up just win, like not even not be the best or whatever, like strictly to win. Um, it was because him and his brother, they grew up competing against each other and their dad would give attention to to his brother, Larry. And then um, when when MJ, when he would try to get attention for something like that, that he would like ignore him or like push him away and stuff. So that literally sparked his drive because he wanted to just be better than Larry. He wanted to beat him at anything possible so that he could get attention from his father. Um, so, yeah, it just, it's 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 kind of similar to your thing where it's like you want yeah, to. I mean honestly it's it's the exact same way, but it wasn't my dad. It was like my peers. Like I, I like. Yeah wanted the attention of my peers so badly because they just made my life a living hell and like I wanted nothing more than to just fit in like that's all I wanted um and I never really honestly felt that my entire like grade school experience and like kindergarten through sixth grade like I was never athletic I was never more I was like faster than people and I, I couldn't even jump I was just faster than them but like that was it like that's all I had I couldn't I couldn't beat them in sports like, I wasn't better at basketball. I wasn't better at baseball. I wasn't better at, like, football. Like, I just didn't have anyone there to guide me and to, like, show me how to be good at those things. And so I, I ended up just, again, hating myself. And, all again, all I wanted was their approval, basically. That's, like, all I ever wanted. And my mom was, like, there for me, don't get me wrong, but she was always working. So because she was a single parent, she had to take care of us financially. So she was really never there. Like, we would go to school, and then after school, like, 2.30 – um, like we would end at Holy Redeemer or three, maybe. And we'd go to the children's center and we'd be there till like six, seven, eight, sometimes later, some nights, because like my mom had to work till then. And like, she just couldn't, she couldn't afford to not work, you know, 60 hours a week to, to take care of us. So like, we were always with other people who didn't genuinely care about us. Like they were just like, they were just there. You know what I mean? Like they had, they had to be there. They were paid to be there or it was a teacher or it was, someone that was guiding me along the way and like I don't know just as a little kid like that's pretty that's like a lonely experience like my earliest memories of being alone are from those times in my life like just like my mom not showing up when every other kid is getting picked up from this like daycare the children's center from like first through like kindergarten through like fourth grade like that's my like early memories until I was like 10 so yeah fourth grade like, I remember every age I was. Like, I remember being 11 in fifth grade, 12. Like, I know when all those yeah. time spans are in my head. Like, fifth grade was better. Like, sixth grade was better. Like, every year after fourth grade got better because some of the, the bullies from fourth grade left and went to a different school. So, I just, yeah, it's just like, that's why I just get so, like, like 
in, like instigating people when people instigate me that's just like that's the trigger like that's the thing that just pisses me off more than anything else it's just when people instigate me and I, I don't know it just it's something that definitely definitely plays a big role into why I am the way that I am so I so anyways yeah I get I got to like seventh grade and I go to a new school and this and like this is Riverside so Riverside is like so there's Elwood City and there's Riverside. Riverside is like a more country school, but kids there generally are like more approving. They're not like, even the popular kids are like nicer. Like they're nicer kids. Like the athletic kids are nicer kids. Like I never, like in seventh grade, I did not get bullied by anyone in my class. There was one kid who was a grade above me. The kids above me and the grades above me were relentless still. Like Matt Wilson will never forget the shit that he would say to me and do to me and my brother on the bus in seventh grade would just piss me off like so bad um and just like yeah I, again it was like another trigger so in seventh grade I started playing football and I started getting more athletic more and more athletic and in in seventh grade there was we were at like an open gym it was the end of seventh grade and I had just done high jump so I touched rim because I did high jump all year so I just jumped like every single day at track practice and I was going through puberty at the time I think so like during that year I lost like I was like 130 going into seventh grade and I lost like 20 pounds because of puberty and grew like two or three inches. So I think it was like five, seven or five, eight in seventh grade. So I was taller than everyone. And I was like skinnier now at this time and I was faster than everyone. So I was like getting more athletic and then I did track and it was the first time in like a sport where my performance wasn't dependent on anyone else but myself. Like if you're on a basketball team as a young kid and you're not the, like the coach's son or your parents didn't like help you get ahead at that age, like, you're not going to take the risks necessary to be a good basketball player when you're a kid, you know? Like, I was so afraid of failure because, like, I've just been bullied my whole life and sucked. Like, I, developmentally, I got wrecked because of fear. Like, and, and again, just being bullied. Like, I wouldn't try things. and I didn't have anyone to teach me those things. My mom didn't give me context where I could get better. And my brother was a little bit better off because he was better than me. So that, I think, built some confidence. And then he, like, went to camps and stuff like that. I wasn't even confident enough to go to the camps. Like, I hated being yelled at. I hated being, like... I was just so sensitive too, because again, I just, I don't know. I guess I'm just a relatively sensitive person. Maybe that developed from being bullied so much. I don't know, but that's just the way that I am. So track's the first time that I'm like able to kind of like seventh grade. I remember going out for track and just being better than everyone else, like immediately. Like I didn't have to do anything. I was just better than them. And there was a teacher that told me like, Hey John, like if you work really hard at track and field, you can get a college scholarship. And my mom had always told me growing up that I would have to pay for my own education. Like I would, like I knew that in my head, like it was never, ever, there was never an expectation that I was going to have my shit paid for my car, a car college, like anything I wanted. Like I had to, it was my, it was on my own, whatever I could do really like in the outside of like, obviously the obvious things, but anything extra beyond that, like that was not going to happen. So I immediately basically made it a goal to like get a college scholarship and track in seventh grade. Like that was where it started. And I, so I go for track that year and like we, we go up against Elwood city and I just beat every single one. I remember going to that meet and being like, I am going to fucking ruin them. Like I'm going to beat every single kid that bullied me in high jump. Cause they all high jumped and they were all the most athletic kids at that school. So they were, the, they were always known to be faster and jump higher and yeah. just, freak athletes like oh they're the fastest kid on the baseball team and i'd always be like okay whatever and so like get to that meet and i'm just like fuck these kids like i'm not talking to them i'm not looking at them if they want my attention because at this point i'm starting to get more notoriety like for being good at track as like a seventh grader from the seniors or juniors or whatever else and i was just like i want to beat them so bad like i want to destroy them i don't i don't want to just beat them like i want to kill them and i don't want to talk to them and i want to just i was just so pissed off i was just like the most pissed off little kid so i like go into that meet and I just fucking wrecked them. Like it wasn't even close. Like the bar was like at four, six or whatever. And they, they could, the, their most athletic kid couldn't even get over four, six. And I just, I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Like I'm going four, six, four, eight, four, ten, five foot, five, two. Like, don't care. I'm going to. I remember when I was in seventh grade, I went, I think I went over like five, one or something like that. Five foot. <laughs> we were on the same trajectory. <laughs> so I, I like that that like satisfaction and and just like being able to grab rim and getting notoriety like that attention that i got for doing that just it fueled me so much to like be better than every single person because it was the first time in my entire life i was better than someone at something you know like i was a average i was pretty dumb when i was in grade school i got to like riverside and like all of a sudden i was a straight a student because i was just competing like i just wanted to win i wanted to be smarter than people then like, eighth grade rolled that's around. how 
that's how that's what happened to me in terms of doing well in school. When I when I reached seventh grade, my best friend, like at the time, like I had just moved and he was a straight A student. And then I was like, I'm going to beat you. That's and then, exactly, yeah, that's yeah. literally when I just started being good at school. It was that moment. Like it wasn't like a gradual thing. It was just like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to try to beat him. Yeah, that's I mean, that's exactly what happened with me. I had a, there was a girl that went to the elementary school with me, Sinead Mackinon. She was in she was going into this algebra class and she had a, the same exact math classes as me growing up. And I was like, hold up. If she's going to go into this advanced placement math class, like I should be in that class too. Cause I'm not that much dumber than her. Like I'm not great, but like I, I can be in that class. Yeah. It's, like, I went in that class and this math teacher, Mr. Cabot was just brutal, like so brutal. And I was just like, I'm still going to do this. Like I was so frustrated, dude. I get so frustrated all the time in that math class because I just couldn't get it. Like things did not come easy to me in school ever. Like people think that I'm just so smart and I'm like, no, like nothing came easy to me. I was the kid who learned how to write his name last and like who couldn't do timetables in second grade and like had to sit there and do them last. And the teacher flipped his desk because I like couldn't pay attention. Like I just was a mess. And I just remember getting into that and just sticking through it. And I just squeezed by an A like every single, you know, quarter. I would just be like A, 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 just barely or it'd be like A, A, B, A. And like yeah. barely I ended up getting A's and it was like, I don't know. I just for whatever reason that just competitive desire inside of me just kind of came out. And then after that, it was just like, all right, I'm going to be the absolute, I, my goal at that moment was like to be the best, the best jumper that I could possibly be. Like when I was in seventh grade, I was like, I'm going to be the best high jumper. I want to clear seven foot in high school. Like that was my goal immediately. So, I mean, I didn't achieve that goal, but I, something better came out of it. And what I'm doing now, which is crazy to look back. Cause like now it's like, Oh, you failed. It's like, well, not like, yes, but no. <laughs> so, yeah. Then like eighth grade rolled around and it was like, all right, like I'm going to, I'm going to just dive into everything I can possibly learn about jump training. And so I read the jump manual and did the jump manual. My mom bought me a book for Christmas. It was called Power Plyometrics by Jim Radcliffe. And I read that book like the entire time. And how did she know to get you that book? Dude, she just went to the store. I have no idea, man. I honestly, I don't know. She just like saw it. I don't know if she talked to my uncle. I don't know if my uncle got, I honestly don't know. I need to ask her that question, but I was disappointed because I wanted something gimmicky at the time. I remember that for Christmas. I was disappointed. You wanted the, you wanted the oh, see, I'll... <laughs> I wanted the ass over heels program. program. <laughs> ass behind heels program. That's what I wanted. And I just couldn't get it. No. Uh, so I, well, there was another important part that happened to this story. When I was in seventh grade, we were at an open gym. And like I said, the, the guys in my sister's class were assholes to me, like just such dicks to me. Yeah. And I remember they told me, cause they would have been freshmen in high school at the time. And I was a seventh grader and I was like at an open gym and I was trying to dunk on, on one of the rims. It's a little bit low. And I was like, yeah, I think I can dunk. Like at the time I was like getting my hand to middle of the rim or something like that. And I was like, I, I mean, really like, I'm not that far off. Like, I think I'm going to be able to, dunk. I think I can almost dunk. And they're like, no, you can't, you'll, you can't dunk. Like they just like spoke down to me and they're like, you sound so dumb right now. Like just, I remember Josh Anderson just saying the meanest shit to me and Zach Rorick and like them just belittling me in that moment. And me just being like, fuck you. Like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to do everything I can to prove you wrong. And eighth grade rolled around and the same thing happened, but it was a teacher this time. It was a coach. It was like, no, you're not, you're not going to be able to dunk. Like you can't do that basically. And I was just like. I remember I had this moment where I tried in a game, like in a practice and just got rim stuffed. And that was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, like you're not as close as you think you are, but like you, you need to work as hard as you can. You need to put in as much time into this and you need to work smarter than everyone else so that you can achieve your goals. And, and, and like went home. That's when I got power plan metrics that winter came into high jump season after doing that program and high jumped eight inches higher and ran the hundred. We had this, we had this track and field day. And I was like considered to be athletic in the class, but I was not like the most athletic. And then we had a track and field day and I ran a 12 one in the hundred and I dusted Tom Mansfield, who was like the most athletic kid in our class, like good at baseball, good at basketball, supposed to be the quarterback of the football team. Like, uh, you know, supposed to be the fastest kid. And I remember he killed me out of the blocks, like killed me. And then like, we got 20 meters in bro. And I just hit another gear that he just did not have and just blew by him. <laughs> Ended up running like a 12 one, which by the way is like faster than you run right now. And I was like in eighth grade. <laughs> hey, I ran 12 flat. 12 flat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. True. So I just remember like, so I did that and I just like came into the, um, like that entire year I just trained so hard. And then that end of that year, I got my first dunk and it, like, it was in an open gym. Like no one saw it. And so, like, the entire summer, same thing, like, training the entire summer, power plyometrics, basically, right? 
came into the following year and the like first practice, like people that knew that I could dunk, like they knew that I had been training, they knew I'd been putting work in, they knew I could jump. And they were like, John, like, let's see, like, let's see you pull one down. And I was just like, I got so excited. I remember that moment. I just got so excited. And I was like, you're about to see all of the work that I just put in for two years because of what this one person said to me. Like, I'm about to, I'm about to demonstrate to every single one of you haters, like how good I got. Dude, I went up and I crammed the shit out of the ball. Actually, the first one I went up was from the right. And I went up and dude, I got so high. Just like, it wasn't even, it was like a, you know, the back rooms that you just shouldn't miss, but you do. Like yeah. it was that. And I was just like, oh my God. I was like, I don't know what just happened, but like go to the other side. And bro, I just went up and just fucking crammed it from the left side. <laughs> like everyone went crazy, just like throwing the balls off the wall, screaming. The coach was like, the coach, Mike Wickline, he wasn't the one that said I couldn't do it actually, but the other coach was, and he was there and he saw it. But uh, he was he was like the hardest basketball coach I ever had. He didn't see it. But I just remember like kids like Monix, Don Bedica, like these kids in the class below me were just going crazy. They were just like, how in the world at like 5'10 and and like 15 years old did you just like not just dunk, but you you slaughtered the ball. Like it was like you see my one handers now. That was like what I had on that day. So like after that, through practice, I had like two or three more dunks and like these drills. Like we would do these drills where it was like pass, pass back, pass back, back, you're running down the side of the court, and there was a layup. And bro, I just went up and I just crammed it again. Like, and everyone was just like, this is crazy. Like, it's not a one-off thing. Like, he can straight up dunk. And like, at the end of practice, like, I tried again and I just couldn't. Like, I just had no gas left. Like, I just was <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah. And like, after that, I was just like, wow. That was like, it was honestly one of the best days of my life. Like, that experience was so crazy. And so that, again, that started this like obsession with just like wanting to learn everything that I possibly could about like jumping, you know what I mean? And, and, after that moment, like I basically just dove in. Like you look at me freshman year, I got on websites like Elite Track, and like now I've read basically a textbook on plyometrics. Like now I understand the science behind it, and I've read it not once but twice. And I've read it over the course of two years. So now I know everything about stretch shortening cycle. I know everything about tendons and elasticity. I know about uh, the stretch reflex. I know about the Golgi tendon organ. I know about plyo plyometric progressions and stiffness and being able to hit the ground before it hits you, how to do depth pumps, bounding, like super high level plyos that even my athletes now don't use, you know, and, and they're pretty well developed. Um, so I, so I like just, you know, started doing this and I kind of hit a plateau in my sophomore year in track. And I basically was like, screw basketball. Like I, I want to be dedicated to, well, actually, sophomore year, I walked out of the gym in basketball. I remember that because Jake Thelman, like, elbowed me in the throat and, like, pushed. I don't even – it was, like, a bunch of stupid stuff. And I was like, that's it. I'm not playing basketball. Like, you guys are dumb. I, like, would – after my freshman year, I would, like – I basically didn't care, like, what anyone else was going to tell me. In my mind, I was like, I will create whatever it is that I achieve. Like, I'm going to be self-made. No matter what anyone tells me I can't do, like, I'm going to do whatever they say I can't. And that was, like – like, it demonstrated to me that if you work really hard – and you're really diligent about something and you don't quit, like you can be great. And that was the first time that I had experienced that, you know, at a really important developmental age. And that was like why I just didn't handle disrespect. Like after that, I was like, I don't take disrespect because of the way that I was treated as a little kid. Like if you're going to disrespect me, like one, I didn't do anything to really deserve disrespect because I wasn't, honestly, I was a lot more humble than I probably am now. I'm just going to flat out say it. <laughs> so yeah, I just like didn't talk shit. I like didn't really care. I was just like, I'm just going to do whatever. Um, but I valued science at this point because science is what got me better, right? Like I was like, science did this, like this objective evidence from this SNC coach from Oregon made me better. And so after that, dude, I just dove into track science, like everything I could read. You Any research paper you could find on sprint performance. I remember reading an article about why the hips were the most important part of sprinting. I remember reading about depth jumps and ground contact times and how the tendons interact with stretch shortening uh, with the stretch reflex and how there's different latencies on stretch reflexes. I remember reading about high jump and positionings and, and why depth jumps were the most specific thing for high jump, like all this different stuff at a very young age, just diving into actual research, you know, not just like frou frou articles, but like research articles, you know? Yeah. Um, so then I just, I just started checking more and more into it. And I was on this website called Elite Track and the writer of that website, Mike Young, um, had been at LSU for six or four years, six national championships. He worked with the multis there, the high jumpers, the long jumpers, just a brilliant coach. He worked under Bush X Nader, one of the greatest track coaches ever. And I just, that was the first website. I basically was like, Oh, the content on here is legit. Like I know what scientific writing looks like. I know what scientific articles and coaches and like things like that are, are about. And so like, I just started again, reading everything I possibly could. 
Um, so during that time, I wanted him to coach me. It was my junior year now. Kind of had a plateau sophomore year. I jumped 6'2 in high jump, ran like a 51 in the 400, ran, I think I long jumped 21 feet, triple jumped like 44 feet, so or 43 feet. So I was like, okay, I, I need to get better still. Like I want to improve more. Um, you can double check those numbers on TFERS, by the way. You'll be my guest. John Evans, Riverside High School, 2010. Uh, so I train that entire year. So like, so my after my sophomore year, I worked at a Bible camp. And I was like mowing grass and stuff. I used all the money that I made from that Bible camp, which is like basically none. It's the Bible camp. And I took it and I, I paid for coaching from Mike. Like I reached out to him and I got him to coach me. He had a PhD in biomechanics. He easily had a whole post-collegiate track and field group. One of the most brilliant coaches I'd ever, and I just happened to come across him. Like I was obsessed with finding the absolute best coach in the country. That's all I wanted to do. I was like, I don't care. Were you, were you a, were you a one month on and then done dude? No, I, <laughs> you want to talk about that, dude? I was, I understood the process at this point, like, because I knew from years of trying to get my vertical up, it, it was more than just a month. You know what I mean? Like I was dedicated to this for life to be the best I could, but I had just seen him evolve athletes from just like subpar, like great athletes to even better athletes. Like he was coaching seven foot high jumpers. He was coaching national champions in the decathlon, heptathlon. And I was just like, I want to do this. Like, I want to be the best athlete. I want to reach my genetic potential. I don't want any question about it. And I want a scientific approach. And I remember on his website, it said this. It was like, if you went to the doctors and the doctor gave out the same exact prescription to every single person, would you be pretty pissed off if you paid the same, the same price as the guy that went to a surgeon that told him exactly what was his problem and gave him a pers- specific prescription to, to fix whatever that problem was and that every person was different and needed a different prescription. And like, which of those two experts would you go with? And I was like, well, that's obvious. You want to go with the highly qualified expert and not the voodoo witch doctor. <laughs> like it was just made sense to me. And I was like, oh yeah, of course. Um, so Ooh, yeah. Doctors give you the answers instantly, John. <laughs> no, they, they have the answer. They're gurus. Uh, but yeah, he, he just like, he, to me, demonstrated that he was the best coach. He had the most credentials. That was really it. I looked at credentials. I did not care about what you thought you knew or what you said you knew because I had seen all the gimmicks with, like, jump programs at this point. You know what I mean? Like, I'd seen the jump manuals. I'd seen the vert or air alert. I'd seen, you know, all that stuff over and over and over again. And I basically was just like, no, like, I want the best. And so Mike started coaching me. And I trained every day for three hours. I would go from, and that's basically like two to three hours. Uh, and I started in July and I didn't, and I would train every single day, no matter what it was, dude, I would train at 8, 8 PM, 10 PM. I would go to the, the parking lots and I would run, I would go to the track. I would have my mom, like my mom would turn on the headlights and I would just run. And we would get like police officers would come and be like, what are you guys doing out here? I'm like, I'm just training for track, dude. <laughs> like, I'm just like here to run. Like, that's what I'm doing. And I'm here to do my tempo workout. I'm here to do my whatever. And Bro, I just became so freaky. Like, I was athletic before. My squat went from 225 to 365. My power clean went from 115 to 215. My uh, And I was 16 at the time. Um, My standing vertical went from 30 to 34, 35. My broad jump went to 10, increased from whatever it was, like 8, 11 to 10 feet. My standing triple jump was like 30 feet. I was just, I was like really, really, really athletic. (laughs) Like, I was just very strong. I could dunk off two steps. Um, I didn't really do anything like I didn't practice dunking during this time. I only trained like I basically did not give a crap about dunking at this point. It was all about track, uh, specifically triple jump. I practiced triple jump a lot. So I was like feeling good. I felt like ready to come into the year. I was I remember being so heavy, though. So I gained I gained 40 pounds of muscle that year. And I was just like I was like, man, I'm like heavy. Like I'm a I'm a big dude right now. And I don't know how I'm going to be able to jump like at this weight now. I mean, I was way stronger, but my reactivity, I just felt so heavy. Like I just felt like I could not get off the ground anymore. Um, so I was a little bit concerned about that, but I basically, my high school track coaches, this is like, they basically told me that I had to stop working with him. They told me I had to stop working with a coach from LSU that was whatever, all those credentials. They were like, I, we know more than him. I'm more high school track coach. And I was like, you're kidding, right? Like, this is a joke. This isn't real. Like, you're, you actually think you know more than him? It was indoor track. And they're like, yeah, like, you have to work with us. And I was like, I was so pissed because I didn't have access to facilities. The only way I could get access to facilities is if I went through them. And to do that, I couldn't work with Mike. So now it was in February and they were like, you can't work with him anymore. And I was like, bro, I just put in literally thousands of hours into training like i did the math and it was a thousand hours i put that much time into training this like building up into this point and now you're going to tell me 
that I can't work with them anymore. And I thought my periodization model was just ruined. Like I was going to have no taper. Like I was just going to be screwed. So I like went to my first meet outdoor. So I went through the indoor season, did one meet and I just like was so flat. I still ran like decent, but I didn't do great. Like not as well as I wanted. So I was kind of disappointed. Then I go into outdoor season and the first meet doing my new coach's training, I like sprained my ankle, high ankle sprain right away. And I was just like, what'd you expect? <laughs> like, what'd you think was going to happen? Uh, and I was out. That was it. That was like the end of my season until the very end of the year. And then I first meet, I came back with a sprained ankle. I jumped six, four PR my high jump by two inches. Like didn't do anything dude for, for six weeks, came back first day, jump six, four, go to my first meet, six, four, six, two, six, four, go to States, jump six, four at States, like no taper, no, like nothing. Just like high jumping, like no training. Just let me see all the residual training effect of what you did in the past. Just add it up to that. Um, and I was, I was pissed, but I was also like relieved, you know, like I was happy with how things kind of turned out. I just always in the back of my head was like, I want to be better. I wish there was more. And I didn't want to go through what I went through. I didn't want to work that hard again and have no benefit. So senior year, I like did cross country for fun, played basketball. And then I didn't even get to compete in track because I herniated a bunch of discs. By the way, during this time I had this entire time, by the way, I've had patellar tendinopathy the entire time. So keep that in mind as well. <laughs> like, uh, my knee pain started when I was in eighth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Uh, it went away when I was training with Mike because I was doing a lot of strength work and I was not jumping that much. So it kind of made sense looking back on it. But that said, um, yeah, senior year, I didn't do anything. I go, I want to do basically that time of my life. Like I wanted, I knew what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to do what Mike did for me. I wanted to help kids online platform correspondence become freaky. Like, cause that was what I loved. Like I loved going through that process. I loved being a freak athlete. I loved gaining 40 pounds of muscle and being faster than me. Cause like I gained so much respect that year. Like just, you gained 40 pounds in high school, bro. Like people were like, this kid's a freak. Like seniors knew who I was because like I could dunk, but then I just took it to another level. Like, bro, I just went, I was like super saying one and I just went super saying three. Like it was like, I'm leaving high school and I'm going to be a freak athlete. Like that was my goal. That's all I wanted to do is just be the freak athlete I could. Um, I would just have like visions basically of me being like hitting a 45 inch vert or 40 inch vert, like legit, like, you know, on a vertex. That's what I wanted to do. Um, back, I probably did have close to a 40 inch vertical, but again, if I fudge my reach legit, no, <laughs> some days, maybe, maybe like pregame adrenaline, maybe, maybe I would have touched it a couple times just based on the dunks I was able to do. Like I could do a tomahawk, two hands, like pregame, like I could drop the ball in like getting whatever mid form to the rim. So I was wanting to do an elbow too, but I didn't really care about dunking. Dunking wasn't a thing at the time. It was like 2011. Like it was, but I watched TFB every day, by the way, also that's a big detail. I used to watch seventh grade on. I watched TFB every single day, every day, <laughs> like T Dub, Golden Child, whatever else. Like Golden Child was my favorite. He was the best. Anyways, so I go to my, my he does jump high. I went into my freshman year of college, and at this point, I know way more than I should about science because I also asked Mike everything that I was doing and why I was doing it. So I knew, I knew the end product of getting a PhD. And putting a program together and knowing why you put that program together. I knew that when I was uh, 19, right? Like most kids don't figure that out or most coaches don't ever figure that out maybe. And like, I knew that at 19, like that was a problem because I was way ahead of everyone else. Like Isaiah, if you knew at 16, what your high school coach was telling you was wrong, like to the degree that I did, I mean, you already had anxiety about what he was having you do. Like, can you imagine how I felt? <laughs> like I was uh, devastated. Um, so I went into college and like basically had a really hard time with my authority figures and professors because I said I was going for nutrition or like RD, right, registered dietitian or like PT because I was really smart at the time. I graduated second in my class or third in my class. Um, so that was like the safe thing to say, you know, like you graduate high school, like, oh, what are you doing? What's your degree? Like you have to know, you have to have it figured out. Yeah, what what I'm in here. yeah exactly. That's what you thought. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's not really what I, what I want to do. Like in my heart, I know what I want to do, but I'm just like saying this safe answer. Cause it sounds better, you know? And like, people will respect me more if I say that versus what I actually want to do, which is like be a jumps coach and coach track, um, be the best jumps coach in the world. Like that's what I that's what do. bothered me even as, as early as like a year ago, like <laughs> telling people about what I want to do and all that stuff. And like that you always get weird looks. Yeah. People, people don't, they, I mean, yeah. But our job is non-conventional, like for sure. We don't, it is, it's just the reality of the situation, but it is what it is. And it worked out for us. So 
dude, as they say, like, fuck them. Anyway, so. Peter's boy. Yeah. <laughs> so I go in. So fresh, like college, I'll, I'll kind of skimp over. But this is where the I'll just skim through the professional development part here. So basically, my schedule was I go to my classes or whatever. I would read articles and stuff like that. And I would watch YouTube videos, like just make sure I was staying up on it. Yeah. And then I would talk to my mentor, Mike. So after my sophomore year, I did an internship with him at Athletic Lab, which is the business he owned. And I, every single day, I would go to him and I would ask him questions after the day. So I'd follow him around all day. Like every single day, I'd follow him around and, and write down everything he did, dude. I'd have a notebook in hand, just write down everything he did. And then I'd, I'd, I'd ask at the end of the day, he, I'd get 10 minutes with him. I'd be able to talk with him because he was so busy. And I'd be like, hey, why did you do this, this, and this? Why did you do this and this? Why do you do this? Why do you do this? And I would do that every day for a year. Or for, sorry, I did that every day for three months. I like moved across the country when I was like 19 or 20 years old. This was not normal at the time to do. <laughs> like now I think with social media, it's a lot more common. But like what I did was a big risk. And it was like, like people at the time were still like, oh, you meet him on the internet. You're probably, he's probably going to be a predator. Like that's the way people's mindsets were. <laughs> like, and so for me to like take that risk was pretty crazy. But I went there, learned like so much underneath him, come back to school. My professors threatened to kick me out of the major because I wanted to work with sports teams at the time. Like that's fucked up, dude. Like you just went and spent all this time learning as much as you possibly could. And your mentors, like you're under your mentor and this guy who's way better than any strength coach on campus, right? And like light years better, it's not even close. And the professors of your program yell at you for getting experience. They're mad at you for doing that. And it's like, what? Like, how does that make any sense at all so I was like pissed off about that so I go into my my junior year basically uh with this mindset of I'm better than every single one of you because I've already achieved proficiency beyond what a master's degree student would do and I'm a junior in college like I don't have to listen to any of you you're not going to tell me anything I don't know like we like in actual x phys because now the classes are getting really specific you know so it's all about cardiac rehab and ex like clinical exercise physio physiology, how to take blood pressure, how to do body comp, like stuff you don't care about if your goal is to help people jump higher. Like you honestly just don't care. Bro, this, just, this is giving me flashbacks from my entire like year and a, last year and a half of school. Yeah, you know, you know exactly. Like this is why I tell kids don't go into X. X One time. dope thing that I did was take my, my, uh, my body fat percentage in a bod pod. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> one thing. You have one thing. That's the one thing I was like, oh, that's pretty dope. Other than that, yeah. Like I would say out of that out of that experience, like I look back at college and the classes that I still use today is like applied anatomy, I still use all the time. X phys. We only had one X phys, or we had X phys and advanced X phys, but advanced X phys didn't even come until later. And biomechanics. That was it. Those are the only classes I used. Even the SNC class was a joke. Like it was a joke relative, especially relative to what I had done. It helped me understand moment arms, which was good. Um and and things like that. And I did that stuff extremely well. And physics. Physics was another one. I'm really glad I had physics one. So you kind of look at like all of the, like really it was five classes I benefited from in four years of school. Like that's, a, that's unbelievable. That's a joke. Like that's a joke, dude. So they yes. didn't equip me with what I needed to be successful, honestly. That's like I, 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 get, I, got, I got asked this the other day and I've, I've had it a few times, but like, like there will be kids and they'll act, like they're about to go to college and they'll ask me if like exercise science is a good major. And like, I always respond like, yeah, it's it's good, but like just do what you love. Like, you know what I mean? I learned I learned more outside of school than I did in school. And at the like going through just getting a regular bachelor's degree, like that's just going to give you a surface level understanding of a broad array of top topics. It's not going to if if there's something specific you want, so for me it was it was like you, like I just wanted to learn how to jump higher and how to make people jump higher. Yeah. Like I I learned more about that doing my own research, uh, talking to you, talking to other dunkers and just kind of do it like on my own. But just going to school to any school in the U.S., you're not going to learn how to make somebody jump higher. It's going to give you it's going to give you the credentials. And like in society's view, it's going to give you more credibility. Yeah. But but if you really want to be a goat, you have to go out of your way and do things for your own, not expect someone to like just teach it to you. So what's crazy is like you talk about your experience and talking to all those people like I didn't have that experience like I talked to coaches like I didn't talk to the athletes. So it's interesting like how you kind of learned it versus how I learned it. And that's why I actually loved one of the things that drew me towards the dunk community was that that question. I had all these answers and I was like, well, why do they jump higher than me? Why do they consistently jump higher than me? Why are they improving and they're already at an elite level? Like, how are they doing that? 
And the key that I was always missing along the way that my mentor didn't know about basketball players, about dunkers, was that they jump all the time. They jump all the time, like way more than anyone else. They practice dunking. It's a skill. And like, I didn't practice that skill. I practiced plyos. I practiced weight room. I was proficient at all of those things, but I didn't get good at the thing I wanted to actually be good at. And part of that was my knee. I couldn't. With my patella, I could not jump that often. I couldn't handle it. And my nervous system. I didn't know to low rim. I didn't know on bad days to just go low rim. Like, you know, I didn't understand how to finesse that situation. Um, you know, had I known that, I probably would have been a lot better. But I didn't know that until 2000 and I don't even know, 17, 2018, talking to you and Austin. So I think, like, you know, you look at you look back at my college experience and I was pissed off at my my advisors. Like, I was pissed off at the professors. They they Things that happened to me, unfortunately, along the way, my track coach basically disowned me, essentially, said that I would amount to nothing and I was going to work at the Y. That was pretty debilitating. Didn't like that very much. Um, I, know, don't, I don't understand how you came across so many negative people in your life. <laughs> like, mom, it, it doesn't my, make sense to me. Like My mom, same thing. My mom, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your life? Like, you're going to, you're going to, how are you going to do this? Are you going to be a PT? Are you going to do this? Like, what's your plan? Like, my mom still said that until two years ago, dude. Straight up, like, said that until I started the business. It was crazy. Um, my stepdad, same thing, like told me, like, I don't, I'm worried about you. Like, I don't know how you're going to make money. I don't know how you're going to be successful. You have so much potential, but like, I just don't see how you're going to make money doing this. Um, you know, I like my entire family basically would belittle me for, honestly, they belittled me for a lot. Like my family belittled me for being a Christian more than anything else. Honestly, like they, they just made fun of me endlessly for it. They used to like T-bone in front of me, which is funny now looking back on, but like at the time it was so condescending. Like that was some of the most condescending shit ever. Cause I was like vocal about my faith, which is fucked up. Um, Kind of, it's ironic that I say fucked up and I was talking about my faith. You can see how things have changed. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, I, uh, yeah, like I, my professors in college, they basically pulled me into their office and said I couldn't work with sports teams and that they had a problem with me and whatever else. My college track coach said I would mount to nothing, kicked me off the team for writing an article that I thought was true. And honestly, to this day, it probably is true. So that I was arrogant, so that I would never be successful. Um, you know, and, and this is someone that I like respected at the time. Uh, you know, I, I almost got kicked out of the major for trying to work with sports teams after I got kicked off the track team. Like, it was just a stupid thing after stupid thing after stupid thing. You know, my AD at the first school I coached at, at Mohawk High School, he said that I, uh, I don't know if I can name the school and then say this. I'm not sure. I, th I mean, this is objectively what happened. He basically threatened to take my pay. I remember going in and asking what my expectations were for the job. And he told me what my expectations were, and which was show up to practice, coach the kids easy i got that he didn't tell me about inventory he didn't tell me about the newspaper he didn't tell me about me handling parents and meetings and knowing how to spell everyone's name like I, I didn't even have a list for that stuff he gave me no direction he just told me coach the kids easy i can do that i can do that better than anyone else i can run it like a well-oiled machine all the other stuff i had no idea how to do that stuff like no clue um so like i just i don't know i just didn't I, I just had all this adversity with every single person I came in contact with. And like, I tried to be a good kid. Like I laugh after everything that I say. Someone told me that the other day and I was like, that's true. I laugh after everything I say. Like if you know me in person, I'm a goofball, but for whatever reason, people just straight up. Yeah. You talk about negativity, so much negativity. I just, so much adversity for no apparent reason in my, in my opinion. And, and it, it gets worse. So then I, after this, I graduate from undergrad and I'm basically like, super depressed after my second semester i like haven't achieved anything at this point i'm just trying to make it through my my professors fail my senior portfolio they called me to the front of the room to do a body composition after we hadn't touched it for six months and they wanted me to do it perfectly every word i'd said they would be like oh well, are you gonna say it that way are you gonna address them that way i would go on i'd start over my you know talk and be like hey my name's john i'm gonna do a body comp today they'd be like oh are you gonna say body comp are you gonna say percent body fat are you sure they're gonna be offended by that they would just like be so condescending and interrupt me and they did that for probably 10, 10 it felt like 20 minutes but it was probably like five minutes realistically but it was the most embarrassed like embarrassed i've ever been in front of all of my classmates like at that moment it was like 20 of my peers 25 of my peers just watching me stumble over words because like they wouldn't let me stop and there was a point where i just like stopped took a deep breath and would try it again and they saw that's just like me getting so frustrated like i almost cried i was so embarrassed like in that moment in front of the whole class and they just kept making me do it like that moment in my mind will like stick with me for the rest of my life because it pissed me off so bad that I like, they saw me on the brink of like crying in front of my, my classmates basically and just kept make me like keep doing it. And, and I wasn't even doing anything wrong. They were just nitpicking to nitpick to embarrass me. And it was just like, that pissed me off 
so bad. It was hazing, dude. It was just fucking hazing. And it was like a professor. Like, that's fucked up. Like, why do you do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. That's just fucking dumb. So, like, that happened. And then they, like, called me in their office. And they told me that I had failed this exam. That was an exam. It was a comprehensive exam of everything we'd ever done. And they're like, oh, you're going to you're gonna get your grade back. You're going to do I'm, like, freaking out, so anxious about it. And I aced it. I got 100%. I was like, you guys are such assholes. So we get to my senior portfolio, subjectively graded, right? They gave me an F, bro. Like a literally, literally a 30%. That's what they gave me on my senior portfolio. Bro, at this moment, I have not got a B since seventh grade in any class ever. Like it wasn't a shitty project. They just gave me a B because, or they failed me because they hated me. Like they, they did not like me. And I was just like, at that moment, because they thought I was arrogant. They thought I was a know-it-all. And like, I, to this day, I'm still a know-it-all. Yeah, but I actually know my shit. I actually know it all. Tell me something I don't know. Fine, whatever. I don't know it all full How well. How are babies that. made? Huh? How are babies made? <laughs> I don't know. That one, I don't know. No, I'm saying, like, <laughs> as far as jump training is com comes and, like, ex-fizz and stuff like that, like, when it comes to what I wanted to do, like, I had the answers, bro. I was obsessed with this since I was 13 years old and was looking at research. Like, there wasn't a question I really hadn't come across. Like, I was just, like... And and now you've seen me get frustrated about this. Like there's there's not a lot that you could throw at me and I would be like, yeah, I don't understand this at all. Like this is totally out of my wheelhouse. Calculus. I don't understand calculus. I understand it practically. I don't understand it like how to do it, you know? That's where like, I come in. That's where you come in. But I it just I, and like to me that just was dumb. Like how can how does being confident end up like and being confident in my abilities and working at it to be the best, like and still being hungry for that? Like how does that how does that disqualify me as a coach like that just makes no sense to me so to me that that happened after my i was 21 at the time so this is five years ago or no i was yeah i was 21 so five almost six years ago so then i go to athletic lab or no i go to grad school grad school was a great experience honestly it was a little rough at times but like i interned with an otc an Olympic training site i got to volunteer coach as a you know at track and field and i was training myself the entire time so it was a great experience so i did that for two years during that time i went to altus we're at 51 minutes, so I'm going to try to keep it short, but this is an important part. Altis is a track and field group in Phoenix where they were working with, I don't even know, it felt like 45 to 50 athletes at the time. <coughs> and they were all the best coaches in the country. I don't know. Have I told, I told you about Altis, right? That's yeah. certain. So basically, like, there was this guy named Dan Path. If you guys don't know who that is, like, you should look him up. He's one of the best coaches ever. He actually mentored... Boo Shexnader, who mentored my old mentor, Mike. So that's like, I was going to the top of the coaching tree whenever I went to Altus. Like, I superseded the guy that coached Mike to be a great coach. Like, I, I don't know. It was weird to go back. I, the only coach I haven't worked with in that tree is like Tom Telez and Boo Shexnader. Um, So yeah, I go and I work with, uh, I work with Dan at the time and a coach named Stu McMillan. Stu McMillan was coaching Andre de Grasse, who got silver at the Olympics in the 200 and bronze in the 100. He's a Canadian sprinter. So I got to see his Olympic prep for four months prior to that. Greg Rutherford, 2012 Olympic champion um, in the long jump and from, from GB, gold medalist. Uh, 2016, I think he got bronze or silver. Um, Ellen Nelson was one of the fastest girls in Australia at the time she was there. Uh, there was Wilfred Kofi, who was one of the, he was like a 10-2 guy in the 100. BJ Lee went to USC. I think he was a 10-2 guy. Curtis Mitchell, he was a national champion in the 200 meter dash at the time, or uh, he was a he. I, I think in 2011 he was national champ in the 200 meter dash. So like super freaky athletes, you know what I mean? Fabrice Lapierre, world silver medalist. Um, Mitchell Watt, Olympic two time Olympic silver medalist. Like you know, Christabel Netti, best long jumper in Canada. Like just freak athlete after freak athlete after freak athlete. You know, like it was just like. So many Olympic caliber athletes there. Oh, Aries Merritt, world record holder in the hurdles. So I just like, same thing that I did in my previous internships, walked in, just that would ask questions like every single day. The thing about this one is I kind of knew how to do internships and I was pretty confident in myself, but this is obviously another level. Uh, this is like a, a big step. Yeah. And you couldn't ask questions at this level. Like you couldn't interrupt practice at all. You know what I mean? And so I would take notes and I would pay attention to what they were saying. And I would try to talk to Stu or, or, um, Stu would basically not answer questions. Like he just would not answer questions that I had. And that was really hard. Cause it was like, how do I learn? Like I'm just watching practice. And I'm supposed to pick it up. Like, how am I supposed to learn? But then there were coaches that would come in every two to three weeks that would do these ADP things where there was like apprentice coaching or ACP apprentice coaching program. And so like they would bring in like Kelly Sturette would come in they had, um, Matt Jordan would come in. They'd, he was like some of the top experts in a field, you know? 
uh, and they would just speak. And so I would attend the, attend the lectures and I'd take notes and I ran their social media, which was really stressful and I hated it. And I basically, there was a period of time there where I just got like super lonely. Uh, and one of the therapists would like bully the shit out of me. And I just hated that. I was like, dude, why? Like, this makes no sense to me. You know, I didn't do anything wrong to you. Just don't like me because I'm annoying to you. And that's annoying to me. And then Stu would basically kind of do the same thing, but I was like stuck working for them. Like they just treated me like typical intern, you know, like go clean, don't talk to me, you know, whatever else. And it's like, I'm not here for that. Like I'm here to learn, you know, I'm here for 16 weeks. Like I'm here to learn. And Dan was great, dude. He was like a dad to me. He was like a father figure during that period of time. He, and he is that way to all coaches, honestly. That's why people love him. Great educator, super kind, like pulled me aside one day and was like, you look like you were adrenally fatigued. You need to go home, take these vitamins, take these minerals, do it every single day, do meditation, whatever else, mindfulness, like pray, whatever. And like turn my mood around in like a week. Like it was crazy. I was so low. He was like a mad scientist. Dude. Dan's a mad scientist. If you're listening to this, you know, Dan Papp is, you know what I'm talking about. So then I left there, finished my grad school, went to athletic lab, worked finally for Mike. And during that time, I like just got to a point where I wanted to quit. <clears throat> I worked 60 hours a week, got paid 23 K a year. And it was not because they couldn't pay me more. It was because they just, uh, or not, not because they didn't want to, I think it was more that they couldn't, you know, it's just, they just can't, you know, they just don't have the resources to do that. Um, so yeah, I just kind of, uh, decided that it was like time for me to move on. I was like, I'm going to go back to PA school. And then that's whenever I started, uh, basically coaching Austin during that time and then coaching you. And then I started and then I started translating human performance. And during that time, I was living at home, felt like a total loser. I had failed. I, I'm now back at Riverside. <laughs> like, after all this shit, I like failed. I like felt like such a loser. And I like felt like I let everyone down, and including myself. And basically was like, screw it, I'm going to go to PA school. I start, I start translating human performance. At the, I had like collected a bunch of videos of like the athletes at Altis, and I would just post them periodically. And my Instagram just grew from that experience, you know, and like sharing what I had learned from these years and years and years of studying, just posting about it. Um, and Mike knew everything about everything. Dan knew everything about everything. And I've worked with them since I was 16, you know, or worked with Mike since I was 16. Yeah. So like this time, I almost have 10 years under one of the best coaches in the world. Um, and it just made me a really good coach. But I never had how I got, I think, to where I am today, and this is what I will tell people who are listening and maybe want to do this someday, you need to get lucky and you need to prove that you're the best. Like, I've just always had a chip on my shoulder and the desire to prove that I was the best. And I think, like, even working with you, Isaiah, like, you know, even now, I don't, like, I'm not happy with just being recognized with what I'm doing now. Like, my next goal is if I'm going to be the best, like, I want NBA players to know who I am because they know that I know what I'm doing when it comes to yeah. jumping being athletic or whatever else like i'm not content just doing what i'm doing so that said that's basically that's basically it i think i covered all the pieces of how my experience is and how i got to each of those places but there were a lot there's a lot of adversity along the way a lot of people that told me i couldn't do it um i applied for track and field coaching jobs at one time and i got none i got zero interviews 15 places i applied and zero interviews it's crazy uh after all that experience like it was just like a weird path to get to where I am and, and made sense for me to quit. But I basically got to the point where I was like, like, fuck the system, fuck the man. I'm going to be so good that I, I like, I can't be denied, you know? Um, I want it to be undeniable that I am objectively one of the best coaches in the, in the world at what I do. And I don't know if I'm there yet. I have no clue. I think I'm good at what I do. I think that would be a stretch for me to say, but I am working on being that person, you know? And like, how do I prove that? I think you win. I think at this point you win. Like now it's about me proving through you, through CJ, through Dan, through Isaiah, whoever else, like, can I make them better? Can I continue to make them better? And will they, will they continue to jump higher? And I believe that I can do that. I don't know what your opinion is of it, but uh, we'll see. I guess we'll just kind of see. So that's my story. I know I talked for 58 minutes, put it at two times speed. Uh, Isaiah, I don't know how much of that you knew, but uh, yeah, I guess that's a good question. Yeah, a bit. That's crazy that you knew all that. But for those of you that don't know that, uh, <laughs> chew it up. Think about it. If you have questions for me, don't DM me because I will try to get back or maybe won't get back at all. My DMs, I think I have 60 DMs right now. I need to answer them. Isaiah, are you? I would, I would say we're going to be pretty slow about pushing out content. But after this weekend, is is fucking go time. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's go time. Yeah, it's going to be a level up, uh, hopefully. Up, up in every kind of way. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Anyways, that's the podcast, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe, like. Uh, go to TSP Strength if you're looking for coaching. Hopefully, you guys don't hate me for sharing my honest opinions. Um, there's some hot takes there, but I'm, I'm still working on being the best coach I can be, and, and hopefully we'll continue to prove that. So that's what I got to say. Isaiah, any, any closing Yo, hashtag all your social media posts, THB Strength. I look at all of the things on that hashtag, all right? And be looking, out, be looking out for our Heels Behind Ass Program or Heels Over Ass Program. Our Ass Over Heels Program, it's going to be very good. <laughs> Load up the hips, man. Load up the hips. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about um, hip extension. It's all about deadlift. It's about deadlift and kipping good mornings. It's going to be really good. Good mornings. Kipping. <laughs> what about kipping hip thrusts? Can we add those in? Yeah, we can do kipping hip thrusts. We'll do kipping pull-ups. We'll do kipping push-ups. Everything, we use the hip. We kip it with the hip because the hip is the most important driver of everything you do. It's what yeah. matters. All right? Look it up. Uh, you can Not let me up. Our special mid-air kipping technique. That's if right. In mid-air, you'll jump higher. Yes, because if you understand how your ass and your cheeks play into your heels and how you every movement you do, your cheeks are behind your heels. Uh, you awesome know, like your hip heels. Hip hair, and you, there's no limit to how high you can jump. <laughs> awesome <laughs> like the hip, baby. <laughs> uh, anyways, that's the podcast, guys. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs>